welcome everybody. I want to extend a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us here on the Zoom uh, preview of our tonight's program, our webinar on propagation, as well as say hello to those who are on YouTube turning in via live stream. Uh, we're really thrilled um, that we have so many people that are here today. So welcome. I do want to let everyone know that this event will be recorded and for use educational purposes only through the University of California. Um, we will be posting a copy of this on YouTube for on-demand viewing within a few weeks after tonight's program. Um, there is, you'll notice, closed captioning in English available on this session. You'll notice it at the bottom of your screen. We're also, I want to let you know how we're going to handle question and answers. Holly is going to take a pause twice in her presentation tonight, approximately halfway through and then at the end. If you can locate with your eyes, you can see at the bottom where there's all the little different, the mute, start, video participant, the Zoom um, um, icons, you'll see one that says Q&A. If you have a question that is related to tonight's uh, program, please put your question in that session, that section that's marked Q&A. That's what we're gonna use tonight to take a peek at all of your questions. And we will be um, going through those questions during our two sessions. Um, since we have such a large group, we might not get to all of our questions tonight. Um, we have invited another master gardener, Helen Erickson, who is a very experienced um, propagator, and she might be responding directly to some of your questions. And if not, we'll talk at the end how to reach our help desk. For those of you on Facebook live streaming, if you could put your questions in the comment section, we have a moderator um, that will be passing along those to us tonight so we can make sure to include you as well. We want to include everyone. All right, next slide, please. So again, this is put on by the Master Gardener Program of Contra Costa County. I am sure many of you have seen some of our programs. So welcome back. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, we're really glad that you found us. I just want to let everyone know a little bit about us um, and what we do. For those of us that call ourselves a Master Gardener, it's a volunteer designation that's given after we go through extensive training through the University of California. At that point, uh, we volunteer our time in the community sharing uh, research-based knowledge on home gardening, horticulture, pest management, sustainable landscape practices through programs like tonight and many other programs in our community. So we're glad you found us and we hope you find tonight's program educational. And we could go to the next slide. What we're talking about tonight is cloning garden plants. So we're gonna be going through and talking about propagation and presenting tonight's program, um, Holly Sawyer. She put together a fantastic program tonight. Before we turn it over to Holly, I wanna introduce her and give her a warm welcome. She is a East Bay area native and she became a master gardener in 2015. Since joining the Master Gardener program, Holly's been very, uh, very engaged and very spends a lot of our time volunteering through the executive leadership team of our organization, through many of our programs, Growing Gardeners, Speakers Bureau, new volunteer training, and she's also helped out with our Community Gardens program. Holly really loves the continuing educational aspect of our program, uh, both herself learning new areas and also with the community sharing her knowledge and excitement like she's going to do tonight. After retiring from AT&T in 2009, um, Holly spent her time uh, in her garden focusing on ornamental plants and redesigning her home garden. Propagation is her current focus and passion, and she's used it to expand the lushness of the flowers of her garden. And she is here to tell you about that. And um, she's, uh, this is a really wonderful program, I'm excited to share with you. Before we get started, I'm, we're gonna launch our first poll. Go ahead and launch that. And I'm gonna read it out loud. So for those on Facebook live streaming, if you wanna to respond to the poll question, you could pop that in the comment section as well. Our first question, Holly wants to kind of get an understanding of her audience. Have you propagated plants before? You could choose either yes, choose one answer. I've propagated in water only. Yes, I've done propagation in both water and soil or a rooting medium. Or yes, frequently, but looking for more tips. Or the final answer that you could select is no, but I want to start. We've got quite a few folks 
that are voting. I'm going to give it just a few more seconds. So if you haven't had a chance, pick your answer. Okay, it looks like uh, everyone, pretty almost everyone's voted. I'm going to end the polling and share the results. So Holly, here's your uh, audience. Looks like 44% have some experience doing water um, or a rooting medium. Um, some have done water only and some frequently with looking for more tips. So it looks like we've got quite an experienced group. 19% uh, are looking to start, um, haven't propagated yet. So I'm gonna turn this over to Holly. I think whether you're an experience just getting started or haven't yet started, you'll all be able to pick up some tips tonight. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and hand it off to Holly. Great. Thank you very much, Andrea. And everybody, welcome. I'm really glad to see so many of you here and so many different levels of propagation experience. I hope that you really enjoy this presentation and learn a lot from it. This first slide, if you've been to any of our presentations before, is something that you may have seen. It's the four foundations of success. And these are critical requirements for successful gardening, uh, which includes propagation. As I talk about propagating, I'll include information about what's needed in each of these four areas for success. We refer to these practices as good cultural care. So how does propagation benefit me? Listed first is that it is a sustainable gardening practice. And this is something that's getting a lot of attention and we're hearing it more and more. And a lot of people might not know exactly what sustainable means. And it's very simple. It means that the activity can be maintained indefinitely with minimal impact on the environment. Sustainable landscaping practices are those that not only save money by saving energy, water, and time, they help the environment. The biggest benefit for me is that propagation can be done anywhere by anybody and at any budget level. It can be done indoors, in backyards, balconies, on the windowsill. And I hope that you all find many benefits um, for propagation. So there are basically two types of propagation. Sexual propagation is accomplished um, through pollination with two parents that create seeds and spores. So you get the characteristics of two different plants, um, whether they're this exact same plant or plants within the same family. Asexual propagation is accomplished with only a single parent by cloning. So that means that the plants that are propagated through asexual propagation are exactly the same as the parent plant. There are different methods of propagation, and I will talk mostly about taking cuttings and separation and division, but I'll also provide basic background on layering and grafting without as much detail. Grafting and budding are actually covered in a separate presentation that Master Gardeners provides that gives an excellent um, in-depth overview of what they are all about. And more information on all methods is available in books in your library and through online. So this picture is a picture of a tender, short-lived perennial it's often grown as an annual. It's been rooted in water. And I don't have the name for it because I can't remember what it is. That highlights the dangers of not labeling your propagation efforts. So labels are very important. But once planted, I know it'll be beautiful and I'll probably figure out what it is at that point. Propagation is a great way to carry annuals and other tender perennials through the winter so that they may die down outside, but you'll have new plants to get started when the spring arrives. It's also a really great way to fill in your landscaping with those plants that you love. But don't be disappointed if all of your propagation efforts are not successful. Mine are not always successful, and I don't think anybody's are. Whether you do something that isn't quite the right way, 
or the plant is just rebellious. They don't always take. So what you wanna do is propagate multiple cuttings of the same plant so that at least some of them will make it. I also wanna give you a note here about patents. Patents are a way that plant developers protect their work by restricting unauthorized propagation until that patent expires. If you don't know if a plant that you have in your yard is protected by a patent, it's very easy to look it up online. Just enter the name of your plant and the word patent, and it'll give you information about it. And with that information, it will include a filing date. And patents expire 20 years after the date that the patent has been filed. So once those 20 years are up, it's free game. So there are different propagation methods that are used for different plants, and some plants can be propagated with different methods. I'll describe the different types of plants and the different methods and what works for what plant. Pictured here is a rose, succulents, hydrangea, and croton, and cuttings from each one of these plants will end up the same as the parent plant. So new plants can be created from either stems or leaves or roots. Stem cuttings are the most widely used. They tend to be the most successful. Leaf cuttings can also be very successful. Parent plants, those plants that you take your cuttings from, should be healthy, free of disease and pests. And the best part of a stem for a cutting is usually where the plant is actively growing that's where the plant has the most growth hormone located. For most cuttings, you'll want to avoid new growth with buds or flowers on them. And this bottle brush in this picture has a flower on it only because I needed that flower to be able to tell what it was. But otherwise I would have taken a cutting with no flower on it, or if all of the, cut, the stems have flowers, I would cut the flower off before doing the propagation work. The tools and supplies that you need for propagation are very simple, and you probably have most of them already available in your home. Um, labels and pen and pencil, we've already talked about. You'll need a sharp cutting tool to make a clean cut. You don't wanna leave jagged ends or, or damage that stem. And it's a good idea to sterilize your, your scissors or whatever you're using before and after cutting each separate plant. You'll also want clean and sterilized pots. A good way to sterilize both your tools and your pots is to blend one part bleach to nine parts water and wash well in that and that'll take care of the sterilization. You'll also want to build a mini greenhouse. This is very important for creating moisture and, and it replaces water that your cutting will lose through transpiration. Transpiration is just water evaporation through the leaves of the plant. Um, rooting medium is a non-soil mix that you'll need and then rooting hormone. And I'll give you some more information about those last three items. So for a rooting medium, the simplest and the one we're most familiar with is just plain water. Beyond that, we have our non-soil planting mediums. They should be sterile. That means no living organisms in them. Low or no fertility, no, no nutrients. Good aeration, um, it needs to be really well draining and no heavy soils, which means that you don't want to use soil from your garden. Um, the first thing that you can use is 100% perlite or 100% vermiculite or equal parts of each of those. Perlite is a white volcanic glass. Vermiculite is a light colored, multicolored um, rock, which is made from large mineral crystals. At our garden in Walnut Creek, our demonstration garden, 
our propagators use 100% perlite. Both of these materials are highly porous. They're able to hold the water in the soil. Perlite is harder when you're comparing them. Vermiculite tends to hold more moisture and keeps it available in the soil longer, but both of them are very good choices. Another option for your uh, rooting medium is equal parts of sand, perlite, or vermiculite with coconut coir, peat moss, or potting soil. Coconut coir is fairly new on the market, at least it is to me. I hadn't heard about it until recently. It's purchased in bricks and they're sold in different weights. They do need to be rehydrated. And the way that that is done is that you cover a brick in warm water in a bucket and you'll add four or five gallons of water per five kilo, which is equal to 11 pounds of brick. Then you allow the water to absorb for at least 15 minutes. Once it's fully absorbed, fluff the cocoa coir up until it resembles the ideal soil-like consistency. Peat moss can also tend to dry out and need to be rehydrated. And you just add water until it's absorbed and it also avoid, uh, resembles the ideal soil-like consistency. The last rooting medium option is ready-made seed starting mix. So rooting hormone is very important for most propagation efforts with cuttings. It provides for better and faster rooting, but you don't want to use it for soft, fleshy stems like geraniums, and you don't need to add it to water. And you also don't need to add it to cane cuttings, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. In general, the powder forms of root hormone are less effective than liquid when they're applied at the same concentration, but both really work well, so either one is a great option. You just want to make sure that you follow the directions on the package for dilution if it's a liquid and for using the powder. It's also recommended that you put a small amount of the hormone into a separate container. Don't dip your um, cutting directly into your entire bottle because you want to avoid contamination in case that cutting is diseased or has insects of any kind. To use the rooting hormone, you'll dip the basal, which is just another word for the bottom of the cutting into the hormone. The cutting should not be wet. Moisture will cause powder to clump and it can further dilute the liquid. You'll want to lightly tap the cutting to remove any excess powder before inserting the rooting medium into the pot. So these pictures show how very simple it is to make your mini greenhouses using supplies that you already have on hand at home. These are made of plastic bags with sticks or straws holding them up and away from the plants. And they're also made with soda bottles where the bottom has been removed and the top is left off so that air can get in. If using plastic baggies, you'll want to punch holes in them so that you get some airflow. The plastic fruit and vegetable containers that you get at the grocery store also make great pot greenhouse combinations, and I show them in a later slide. Plastic is recommended over glass because glass can get too hot, but if you don't anticipate that extra heat, you can try with glass if that's all that you have. Be sure to poke those holes in the plastic bags, leave the tops off the bottles, to let air in and make sure that the bottom of your pot or your plastic container has holes in them to excess for what excess water drainage. So pictured here is water to show the importance of well hydrated plants before taking your cuttings. A salvia, a salvia lucantha, which is a Mexican sage bush and an abutilon or flowering maple. So
So when you're taking your cuttings, you want to be sure to water really well the day before or at least one hour before cutting. Try to avoid the heat of the day if you can. Early morning or late afternoon really are the best times. Take a four to six inch cutting from undamaged tip growth, cutting at an angle to promote more roots. And you can see on this picture that these um, cuttings are cut at an angle on the bottom. You'll also want to cut about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch above a leaf node and allow for at least high, three higher nodes so that you have at least two that will be below and one or more that will be above the rooting medium when you put it in. Cut or break off all leaves from the lower two inches, at least two nodes worth, taking care not to damage the stem. Remove any flowers and buds and cut large leaves in half. Now on this abutilon and the sage, I don't consider those leaves to be too big, but if I did, I would just cut the bottom half of them off. And the reason that you're doing that is so the, the plant is not using as much energy to keep those leaves fresh. It's putting its energy into creating roots and new growth. You want to make sure to plant as soon as possible after you take your cutting. If you're unable to plant right away, store it in the fridge with moist paper towels and air within a sealed plastic bag, or you can put it directly in water to plant a day or so later when you can. The moist paper towel and the plastic bag are also good tools to take with you when you're traveling around and you might find something you wanna take a cutting up that will keep it as fresh as possible until you can get it home. So in order to root a cutting, your medium must be damp, not wet, filled almost to the top, and you'll want to tamp down the medium to remove excess air. Um, punch a hole for each cutting to insert it without damaging it or scraping off the rooting hormone. And you can use a stick for that. Um, chopsticks, plant stakes, and bamboo skewers are great tools. Plant at least two nodes and try not to hit the bottom. Don't plant it upside down. The roots do develop more easily from the bottom node. And sometimes they won't root at all if you plant it upside down. You can use your angled cut as a guide and water until it drains through the bottom in order to settle the medium around the cutting. Then you'll want to enclose it in a greenhouse to increase the humidity and keep the plastic off the cuttings with sticks. Poke the holes to allow airflow. And remember, cuttings don't have roots. So the humidity is really needed to prevent wilting, scorching, Leaf, leaf drop and death. Um, place the cuttings in bright indirect light, but not direct sunlight. What I have pictured here are some African violet leaves that I've taken cuttings of, and they are in plastic fruit and vegetable containers. You can use any size as long as it's deep enough for whatever your cutting is going to be and when it grows. And you can see in the front of the left-hand picture, the African violets that I cut off, they are cut at an angle at the base of the stem, about leaving about a quarter inch. And then the top halves of the leaves are cut off and they are inserted into the rooting medium up to the top of the stem, just below where the leaf starts. And then the, the rooting medium is tamped down to remove excess air. This next picture is my cutting of the purple heart. And you can see that roots have developed really well on the one cutting. It was a very long cutting you may remember from the earlier slide. And so what I decided to do was cut it into three parts 
and the other two pieces I will root in rooting medium. I did root this in water, and although water is the easiest rooting method, method with the least equipment needed, plants may fail when they're rooted in water. And the reason for that is that they don't need to struggle to find the water. So their roots tend to be smaller and more fragile, whereas roots that are rooted in uh, rooting medium are thicker and sturdier because they are more, it's more difficult for them to find and take in water. So you might wanna take one extra step before transplanting your, your cutting that's been rooted in water. If you simply want to pot it up, which means put it into a pot or put it into a larger pot than it's currently in, you can do that. And you would fill a pot with a bit of soil, hold the cutting with the roots below the rim of the pot, gently fill the rest of the pot with soil while you fan the roots out so that they're not all clumped together, and then water it thoroughly. However, the extra step is to do it slow and steady. And that's what I have pictured here. You take your water container, which is this glass, and you remove half of the liquid. Then you fill that half with a combination of potting soil, peat moss, or coconut coir, and perlite, vermiculite, or sand. Then you gently put your cutting into that uh, same container, being very careful not to remove the, the um, roots or damage the roots by inserting it too harshly. And so you would leave it that way and replace a little bit of the water every day with a little bit more soil until it's mostly or all soil. And then you can pot it up into a pot. Do not apply any fertilizer until you do your final planting. And if you do need to handle the cutting to keep it centered, either in that water container or in the pot that you transplant it into, hold it by the new growth at the top so that you're not damaging the roots. So pictured here is Salvia Mexicana limelight. It was rooted successfully in 10 days outside during the summertime. So you, but you do want to make sure you take care of your cuttings after they are in their rooting medium. Um, they can't just be ignored and wait for the, the roots to form. If you do decide to leave them outdoors, protect them from direct sunlight, wind, rain and sudden temperature changes. Maintain an even moisture. You don't wanna overwater. You don't wanna let the leaves dry out. Keep an eye on the condensation in the greenhouse. You wanna make sure that there's good airflow and moisture and the cuttings aren't rotting or drying out. You can check your root growth to see how your plant is doing by gently tugging on the stem. If you meet with resistance, then the rooting has begun. Some cuttings will root quickly in four to six weeks or 10 days as shown here. For Scythia only takes four to six weeks, generally speaking. Some cuttings take four months like rhododendron and some cuttings take all winter and through the spring for your hardwood cuttings. And we'll talk about those more later. To see if your cutting is ready for transplanting, Remove it from the rooting medium and replace it if, not, if it's not ready. So you can see in this picture that the entire soil area was well rooted and it doesn't need to be put back into that container. It's ready to pot up into a bigger container or into its permanent spot. Once the roots are ready, to be transplanted, you'll know when they're at least one inch long and they're sturdy. At that point, you'll want to remove the greenhouse to let in drier air, move it to a brighter light and monitor it to make sure that it's still um, staying healthy. Then you can pot it up or you can plant it into the garden. When it's well rooted and you transplant it to the garden, 
You can add an all-purpose fertilizer according to the directions and keep an eye on it to see if it needs anything special, such as a temporary shade cloth, mulch, or frost protection. Do keep notes to document your successes. A garden journal is really a handy thing. Um, success may vary be due to your rooting medium, due to what hormone you use, how much you apply, environmental factors like the time of year you took the cutting, or simply the cutting didn't want to root and you can't figure out why. Based on those, adjust your methods and you'll gain more success over time. So this is a great point for questions. Okay, great. We have a number of them. Um, great. And I'll just focus on the questions that have come in that are related to the information you've presented so far. Um, a couple um, questions, just kind of general uh, questions that have come in that might be useful for folks. Um, someone was asking, is sterilizing with Lysol okay for cuttings um, for, to sterilize the um, tools that I use for propagation? Um, I have not used Lysol. Um, I don't know if it's a good solution. Helen, do you know anything about that? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Lysol is great on your tools. I would not put it on your cuttings. Okay. And you, know, you would not use it in your, in your pots? Uh, oh, you, oh, so are, is the question for sterilizing the pot? The for tool. sterilizing the pot, I would use like a Clorox in water and then let it dry and air out. Um, I, I, I would be a little concerned about using Lysol because there would be some residue from that. Um, but it sounded to me like it said something about using the Lysol on the cutting and I would not put Lysol on a cutting to try and make my cutting um, antibacterial. You want clean cuttings um, to use for propagating your, your rooting medium should be sterile and things will root fine if you have healthy cuttings. Yeah, and, and the question was for tools. So for tools and pots, that, that, that bleach to water ratio seems to be a good thing and then dry it out. But not Lysol is very good for tools. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Helen. Great. Great. Okay. Um, Somebody who is asking, um, and, and this is a question others might have too, is eBay, e, East Bay mud or other tap water okay to use as a rooting medium? Is there a specific type of water that needs to be used? I don't believe there's any special type of water that you need to use. I use my tap water and it works fine. We do have great water in the East Bay. East Bay mud is great. Um, I don't know if distilled water might be a better option if you have water problems. Helen, do you know? I use tap water. Sometimes I will let it air out for a day um, before I use it if I'm rooting in water. I will water my cutting trays just right out of the tap. That's what I do. Thank you. You're welcome. Somebody was asking, what's the approximate success rate for the cuttings? And I'm guessing this is going to be a, it's a depends, but maybe you could share what your experience is and what has led to that higher success rate. I, I think it is a depends. I think 100% um, perlite is demonstrated at our garden to be highly successful. Um, I have success with water for a lot of cuttings but I do see a lot of cuttings fail if I don't take that intermediate step. So I think it depends upon um, just maybe the time of year makes a big difference. And we'll talk in the next half of the presentation about the different methods and what they work on best. So if you use the, the best methods identified for the specific types of plants at the specific times of year, you'll get a, a better success ratio. But I don't think we can give a actual ratio of what is typical. Great. Would you Thank agree, you. Helen? 
Yes, there are definitely some plants that are a lot easier to root than others. I have had a um, camellia that took six months until I started seeing roots and you have to be patient. I've had other plants that rooted in less than a week in a matter of days. And so it depends on the plant, it depends on the time of year. And so it, the old, it depends. Um, mm -hmm. It can be very varied. Yes, okay. thank you. Um, and this kind of may tag along. Um, this individual was sharing that they started three African violets from cuttings over a year ago. One devo developed into a sm small plant, the other still sitting in the potting mix, alive, but not really growing into a new plant. So the question for this example, maybe others is, how long do you wait? When do you give up? Um, I like um, propagating my African violets, but I do not have a high success rate. Um, I have the same experience. I, um, some of them are, are successful and some of them are not. Some of them rot and some of them just sit there. Um, I pot up when I've checked the roots gently, that there are roots, then I put them into a larger pot and take the greenhouse off. Um, if it's rotted, you can definitely tell, and I just pull those out. So um, on your plants that are just sitting there, I would recommend checking the roots and seeing if, they're, if the roots are growing. If they're not, then you might, I don't know if you have a greenhouse on them or not, you might try a greenhouse. If you, don't, if you do have it on there and it's not growing, then try it without. Just move its location, um, give it slightly different conditions, and see if it does any better. Right. Helen, do you have any other ideas? I was typing the answer to a question. Okay, real quick, what, what, which one was this question? We're talking about African violets oh, yes. that are just sitting there and not don't seem to be growing but aren't dying either. Right. When I'm propagating, as long as the plant appears to still be alive, I leave it. You will know when the plant dies. And sometimes um, plants will develop a callus around the bottom of the cutting and the roots will come off of those calluses. Sometimes the roots will just come right off the cutting, but if they develop a callus, that usually takes more time uh, as long as the plant's alive, just leave it in the rooting medium and it might still work. Thank you, that's good to know. Great, and a bunch of questions have come in. We'll have more time at the end. Um, one question came in, should you use a rooting hormone on edible plants? I do not know the answer to that question. Helen, do you know? The only edible plant that I can think of off the top of my head that I propagate regularly are tomatoes from suckers and they propagate very easily. I do not use any rooting hormone. I just take the snap the sucker off, put it in some potting soil, put it in the shade for a while until the roots grow. Usually they have roots within a week or so and then you can grow the plant up until it's strong enough to stick it in the ground in another place. Great, thank you. So some of the rooting mediums you're using, say perlite, a um, question came in, can you reuse those? Reuse the perlite or other rooting mediums? I do. Um, I reuse the soil uh, or the rooting medium from my cuttings. And I don't, I have not had any problems from that. Um, Helen, do you have a more specific answer? Well, do as I say, not as I do. Anytime you reuse, you can introduce um, bacteria and problems into your cutting tray. Do I reuse my perlite? Yes, I do. And usually I don't have any problem. But if you're reusing perlite and you notice that your plants are wilting, it could be that you have a problem in that cutting tray. Um, always using sterile things is going to give you maybe a better rate of success, but if you're budget conscious, go ahead and try it. With propagation, you know, you can experiment with all kinds of things. Great, thank you. 
Great. Um, I think we, let me ask one more. Someone had a question about, and there's a lot coming in, so I'm trying to find it. Um, there was a question that came in about, um, it, it said, ask for clarification that it was mentioned to take a leaf and cut it in half. Can you, they wanted more details about how to cut the leaf. Um, it says, when you say cut a leaf in half, do you mean the lower horizontal half, the horizontal or across the leaf vertical? Okay, I mean the lower half horizontally. So if you're looking at the leaf with the top of this, with the stem end at the top, you would cut the bottom half off. Perfect. And it doesn't have to be exactly a half. And if it ends up being a little bit of an angle, that's fine. The purpose of this is to give it less leaf so that it's using less energy to maintain those existing leaves. Perfect. And kind of related again to the um, to some the location of making the cutting. Do you make the cut above or below a leaf node? Somebody asked. You make it below a leaf node about a quarter inch to a half of an inch below. Um, and but you need to leave at least four nodes above that cut. So it's it's Below, it's below a node, and then you've got four, at least four nodes above it. Great. Okay. Um, we have a lot of other questions. I'm going to go ahead and save them to the end, keep them coming in, and uh, we'll have another Q&A session at the end. Thank you, Holly and Helen. Great. Thank you both also. And those were really great questions, so I'm glad uh, that you're asking them. Herbaceous perennials are some of the easiest plants to propagate. These are plants that die down to the ground each year, but the roots remain alive and send up new top growth each year. These cuttings may root well in water as well as in a rooting medium. For them, you would want to cut it, the new growth any time during the growing season. Older woody stems tend to root more slowly or may not root at all for you. Rooting hormone may not be needed for herbaceous perennials during the spring and summer, and you don't want to use them for the hormone for soft, fleshy stems. Pictured here are herbaceous perennials, rosemary, salvia hot lips, dianthus, also called pinks, and coleus. So softwood cuttings are taken from deciduous or evergreen woody shrubs. You would take cuttings of the soft new growth, usually in mid spring to early summer before the wood has matured. Shoots that work best for these cuttings are those that have some flexibility and bend, but they would break if they're bent further. Um, a good example of that is to take the stem and bend it into a horseshoe. But if you bend it any further than that horseshoe, it could crack or break completely. You want to avoid weak, thin interior stems and vigorous, thick, woody ones and stems that have flowered. If you have to take a cutting from a stem that's flowered, remove that flower because it takes up more energy from the plant. These typically root easily in two to five weeks. And I want to give you a note on abutilons. I love abutilons. They come in all different colors and shapes and sizes. And those cuttings can be taken any time of year. And you can have great success simply by planting that cutting immediately in the soil in your garden. I have not had success trying to root them in water, but I have success had success planting them immediately in a pot outdoors or in the soil. Rooting hormone may not be needed for these softwood cuttings during the spring and summer, but it is recommended to help with the root growth. Pictured here, we have a lilac, hydrangea, forsythia, and a butylon. So here are some pictures of a rose cutting. And this rose was, was uh, propagated by a friend of mine in just four months and it was highly successful. To do a rose cutting, 
you would want to cut six to eight inch sized pencil sized stem that in this case has partially hardened with a flower or a finished bloom. So that is an exception to the no bloom rule. And you want at least four nodes and at least two leaves on top above your cutting. Another difference is that you want to trim the bottom flat just below a node and cut the top at an angle just above a leaf. Trim the leaves to half size if they're large and you'll want to immediately cut, float the cuttings in water until you get them into the house or get them planted. So carry a bucket around with you for that. Insert the cutting into rooting hormone and water it from the bottom by soaking the pot in the sink. Cover the cuttings with a plastic greenhouse to keep the humidity high and the cutting hydrated. You want it moist, but not wet. Top growth does not mean that there are roots yet. And it is okay if the leaves yellow and fall off. They will get new growth. Roots typically begin appearing in about two weeks and the cuttings typically develop good top growth in roots in six months. Four months in this case was great. And that's when they can be planted in a permanent location. So semi-hardwood cuttings are cuttings of new growth from woody broadleaf evergreen shrubs, usually in the late summer, which is mid-July to early September, after the rapid summer growth when the wood is firm but not fully matured. These typically root in four to six weeks, and they typically take the same rooting instructions that we've been talking through. Pictured here is a holly, a pittosporum, camellia, and azalea. So cuttings of woody stems are hardwood. They are, you want to cut the previous season's growth. They're, it's of narrow leafed evergreen and deciduous trees and shrubs during winter dormancy. The cut, cuttings for hardwood is a more difficult and different rooting process. Cuttings should be four to six inches in length. You want the midsection of a stem. This is a difference from the other instructions. The tip and the base of the branch are removed so the cutting has no new or older wood on it. The cutting should be moderate size and vigor to be best. Cut an angle on the top like you do the rose and that's to prevent water from settling on it if you put it outdoors and cut it that angle just above a single or pair of buds. Make a straight cut just below a single or a pair of buds on the bottom. You should use a different meat rooting medium also. Four parts of a peat-free potty mix to one part perlite. And all potting mixes do have the ingredients on the bag so you can see exactly what is in it. You'll want to dip the basal end, which is the bottom end of the cutting in a rooting hormone and plant it in a one gallon pot with your rooting medium, inserting five to seven cuttings around the edge of the pot, leaving just one bud or pair of buds exposed. Water the cuttings, again moist, but not too wet in order to settle the medium. Place the pot in an unheated location with some light. A window in the garage is a great place and keep it there throughout the winter and into spring. Keep the soil fairly dry during the coldest months and increase the watering as the days get warmer. Move the pot outside to a partially shaded spot after the last frost. There should be some shoot growth by mid spring. You can also leave the cuttings outdoors if you have a protected spot like the side of your house and if you don't get hard frosts. So these are going arcane like stem cuttings, typically tropical plants, so mostly house plants. And you want to cut the stems into sections containing one or two nodes. If you look at this picture on the right-hand side, 
the nodes are the sections between those white lines going across the stem. So this has one, two, three, four, five, six nodes showing in the picture. You would dust the ends of the cutting with a fungicide or activated charcoal in order to guard it against excess water, bacteria, fungus, and rot, and allow it to dry for several hours. No rooting hormone is needed for these cane cuttings. You would lay the stem cuttings on their sides with about half of the cutting below the rooting medium surface and an eye facing upward. And on that right side example, you can see two eyes. They are the little white dots right above um, the delineating section of a node. So you could actually make two cuttings out of this section with those eyes pointing upwards. And then you would pop the cutting uh, into a more permanent spot when roots and new shoots appear. Succulent cuttings are very popular and are an easy plant to propagate. You can propagate from either leaves or from stems. If you're propagating from a leaf, the base of the leaf should be intact. It shouldn't have broken off and damaged that end, end of the uh, leaf. You can use a leaf that has fallen off or you can gently remove a leaf by hand. Cut a stem with sharp scissors as you would other cuttings. For both leaves and stems, allow the cut end to dry or scab over, which is about one day for a leaf and a couple of days for a stem. Um, it may take longer, it may not take quite that long, but I would give them at least that long. Remove the bottom leaves from the stem the way you would other cuttings. You can use rooting hormone to help with rooting on succulents, but generally it's not needed. Use regular potting mix or succulent mix as your rooting medium and place the leaf or stem cut side down into the medium or a leaf can be laid on its side on top of the medium. I've had the most success by actually planting them. Mist them with water a couple of times a week or when they're dry and make sure not to overwater. So pictured here on the left-hand side are different kinds of succulent cuttings. Some are leaves, some are stems, and some are offsets. Um, you can see the differences. The middle picture is a jade plant that my daughter had given me, and she propagated it. And for some reason, it did not like my house. The minute it got here, it fell apart. And I took those pieces of it and I put them into rooting medium and they actually took off. They've, they've rooted and they've actually got new growth on them. So I'm very excited about that. On the right hand side are some leaves that fell off of another succulent that I have. So I dried them out and I put those leaves into the rooting medium. I pulled one of them out gently using a spoon so I wouldn't disturb the bottom and you can see the roots growing on the end there. And as soon as I took that picture, I put it back in with its fellow leaves and it's growing. So after cuttings, we're talking about plant division and separation. And this can be done on herbaceous perennials and on multi-branched woody plants by dividing the crown. The crown is also called a plant base. The crown of the plant is the area where the stems join the roots. Roots grow down and the stems grow up from the plant crown. To divide herbaceous perennials, you do it based on when they flower. Spring bloomers can be divided in late summer to fall and late summer to fall bloomers can be divided in early spring before the new growth begins. You would divide by gently lifting the plants using a trowel or shovel and remove enough soil from the roots to see those, those roots. If the stems and roots are not overlapping, gently pull the plants apart as this picture demonstrates. If there is overlapping, 
Use a sharp knife to cut the crown into pieces with shoots and roots. You want an adequate supply of each on each piece of that crown. To, to divide large old crowns, discard the older center portion and create new plants, replant the vigorous new shoots that are at the edges of the clump. If you want to divide a multi-branched woody plant, you would want to do it during the dormant season, which is the winter if it's evergreen. Trim the shoots so that the energy isn't going into those, it's going into the um, growth, and dig up sections of the plant and tear or cut them apart. You'll want to trim the damaged roots as needed, and you may need to divide it with a shovel or hatchet, depending upon how sturdy and hard that um, crown is. Many of the plants that we grow in our gardens have specialized stems and roots. And the primary function of these specializations is food storage for the plant. But a second, secondary function is asexual propagation. And they are propagated through separation and division. Regularly separating and dividing these plants every three to five years will promote larger and bigger flowers more and larger flowers. So it really is something that you'll want to do. The first type shown here is bulbs, and that includes tulips, daffodils, garlic, amaryllis. True bulbs are layered on the inside, much like an onion is layered, and most have a protective tunic layer covering the outside of the bulb. Corns are very similar to bulbs, and some examples are gladiola, crocus, and freesia. Corms have a solid base of a stem. It's round with a basal plate, basal meaning bottom, like a bulb, but it's flatter in appearance. Runners and stolons are very similar. All runners are stolons, but not all stolons are runners. Runners are plants like strawberry plants, spider plant, and the jasmine. A slender stem forms new plants at its node. Plantlets may be rooted while they're still attached to the parent, or they can be detached and placed in a rooting medium. Um, stolons are, are plants like ajuga and mint. And these also have horizontal above ground stems, but they root and produce new shoots when they touch soil so they start rooting pretty soon. Rhizomes are like your iris, canna, asparagus, and bamboo. They have below ground stems as opposed to above ground, and those stems can be cut into sections. Each section will need one lateral bud or eye, and you should be able to see that on the stem. Offsets, some examples of those are bromeliads, pineapple, hens and chicks, and many cacti. And offsets occur on plants that have rosette stems. They look like little roses that form new shoots at the base or in a leaf axil. And a leaf axil is an upper or narrow angle between a leaf stalk and the stem from which that axle is growing or that leaf is growing. You want to sever the new shoots after they develop their own roots. Tuberous stems and tuberous roots have bulbous shaped stems or roots for their food storage. Stems examples are cyclamen, caladium, tuberous begonias, gloxinias, and potatoes. So think about what a potato looks like when you're thinking about tuberous stems. The eyes are nodes and they have one or more buds. On tuberous roots, it's the root that gets bulbous. And some examples are daylilies, dahlias, peonies, and sweet potatoes. Tuberous roots are like roots, but they have no nodes and the buds are present at the stem end. Just today, we put up an excellent short video on how to propagate sweet potatoes on our website. 
So if you go to ccmg.ucanr.org and look on the right hand side column, there will be a link to our YouTube channel and you can see how to propagate sweet potatoes as well as other videos that are available. So the next type of propagation is layering. And layering is a process that develops new roots on a stem while the stem is still attached to the parent plant. And once it's rooted, the stem can be detached to become a new plant growing on its own root system. Layering does often occur naturally when flexible branches touch the ground and take root on their own, like the root, root raspberry bush. And there are six common types of layering that are shown here. Air and simple layering are the most popular types. And the method used depends on the part of the parent plant and the age of the plant tissue that's going to be used. For air layering, it's especially useful for house plants that have grown too tall and have dropped their lower leaves, like a Diffenbachia. So if you have a plant like that, a cane-like structure, you can use air, air layering to grow roots at the base of where the bottom leaves are. And then once you have those, you can cut off the stem that is left and propagate it as cuttings like we've talked about. Um, air layering is also used for shrubs, trees, and vines like azaleas, camellias, and wisteria. Air layers are usually made in the spring on wood of the previous season's growth, or sometimes in the late summer with partially hardened shoots. The shoots used should be pencil sized or slightly larger, and roots usually develop several weeks after the layer is made, and it can then be transplanted. Simple layering and tip layering are very similar. They're done by arching a supple shrub stem that's up to two years old, or just the tip of that stem to the ground and holding it in place with a U-shaped wire or staple. When securing the stem to the ground, you'll want to damage or wound it slightly at the bottom of the curve by pushing on the wire or staple until you feel or hear a crack and then weigh it down. That way, that provides a place for the roots to grow from. This is best done in early spring when the shrub is dormant on one-year-old shoots. Some broadleaf evergreens may be done later if the in the season if after the current season's growth has hardened, such as rhododendrons and hollies. Compound or serpentine layering is when the stem is alternately covered and exposed along its length, producing more plants per shoot. And each exposed portion of the stem needs at least one bud on it to develop a new shoot. This works well for plants with flexible stems such as vines. Again, you will need to wound the stem at the bottom of each curve that's under the soil. Trench layering, which I don't have a picture of here, is very similar to the serpentine layering, but the stem is covered all along its length in a trench with multiple wound points for growth. Mound layering works really well with multiple basal shoots like quince and crepe myrtle. You would cut the plant back to one inch above the ground in the dormant season, then mound soil or a coarse organic mulch over the emerging shoots in the spring to encourage rooting. When roots develop, cut the buried shoots from the parents. To find out if that, those plants are ready for separation, dig slightly around the stem to see if roots have developed and probe gently to determine how extensive the root system is. Only remove the new plant from the parent when the root system is well developed. Be careful not to remove a peg too soon or the springiness of the stem could lift it out of the soil. I have a crepe myrtle in my yard that um, is no longer in a good place. It's now more shaded than it was when it was planted. 
So I am hoping to be able to create more crepe myrtles next season with the mound layering. Uh, I think it's a little bit too late in this season to do that. So here are some pictures of newly layered plants. On the left is an example of air layering. You can see that it's been done on this tree branch where the branch has been wounded and a bandage, a special bandage has been placed around it. The roots will grow from the bottom of the bandage. And when it's a good root system, then it can be detached. The middle is a mound layering example of ivy. Um, and the right hand side is an example of tip layering where it's a philodendron that is still attached to that tip. And you can see that philodendron plant on the left-hand side. And the tip has been emerged in, uh, submerged in uh, rooting medium to grow a new plant. But like all newly planted cuttings, newly layered plants need a little special care. Once they are removed from the parent and potted up, Prune the plant to reduce the leaf area to one third of its size, not just a single leaf, but the whole leaf area. Um, that is to um, help concentrate energy from the plant into growing new roots and growing more leaves. Plants should be shaded lightly during the first season and the shading can be removed after the first winter. Plants then can then be moved to their permanent location. So grafting and budding is a great propagation method that's done to improve features of a plant, such as creating the vigor of a wild plum tree with the sweet large fruit of a farmer's market plum. With grafting, you can also grow different fruits on the same tree. And we had a picture of that earlier in the presentation, which I think is a great thing. In grafting, a branch or bud of one plant is spliced onto another plant. Almost every commercially available fruit tree or rose bush has been grafted. Um, you can tell that a rose has been grafted if you get a, a sucker from that plant and then you notice that it puts out a flower and the flower is a different color. It's probably a, a red color. That's from the root stock and not from what was grafted on top of that. Also, all Japanese maples are grafted onto the root stock of the same hardy stock. So you will see that. When a tree is grafted, you will see a line where the graft was done when it was just a small plant. The graft is long healed over by the time you purchase that, but you will almost always be able to see that line and there will be a difference in the bark texture and color. Rootstock are typically selected for qualities like disease resistance, drought tolerance, and quick growth. And the um, cutting that's spliced to the rootstock is called the scion, and it is selected for its fruit or flower qualities. There are many different techniques for cutting and splicing the scion to the rootstock. And don't be discouraged if your grafts don't take. The rate of success is low even for good grafters. So we have reached our final poll. Andrea, do you want to lead us through that? Absolutely. Let's launch our final poll for the evening. And where the first one was check one. This is a check the all that apply kind of question. So the question is, what do you want to propagate most? So Holly shared a lot of different plants to propagate. Are you thinking that after tonight, um, you want to propagate house plants, herbs, perennials, shrubs, succulent, something else? Or after hearing all this, maybe you've decided this isn't for you. We'll let you cast your votes as many as you want that you think apply to you. We've got lots of folks coming in and those of you on live stream, if you wanna participate, feel free to post in the comments. We'd love to see what your thoughts are, what you're hoping to propagate as well. All right, we've got 
over two thirds. Give a few more minutes. All right, that went up quick. All right, we have almost, we have about 90% participation. That's great. I'm gonna um, end the poll and let's share the results. So wow, lots of folks are interested in perennials. So that was the most popular, um, followed by succulents. Those are so popular. Herbs, lots of house plants and shrubs, and a few others. But it doesn't look like you scared anyone away, Holly. I'm very <laughs> glad to see that. <laughs> Thanks for participating in the poll, everyone. Okay, so we will move on. Should we go to the next slide? Yes. Well, I want to thank you, Holly. That is the end of her presentation, but hang tight. Uh, we do have our final Q&A session. And Holly, we have a lot of questions. Wonderful. Helen's also been answering a ton of questions as well. So we're hoping to get to as many questions as possible. But there is a lot of different ways that everyone here uh, tonight can access information from our program. We have so many wonderful things available on our website. We encourage you to check it out. Um, we've included our website here, and I believe the library has put that earlier in the chat box if you want to copy and paste it from the chat. Also, there's lots of different ways to keep up with us on social media. We have Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and also we have a YouTube channel. Our handle is the same for all of those different social media sites. It's at big C little O, big C little O, then MGUC. Um, tonight's um, program will be posted on YouTube in a couple weeks um, and all of our prior webinars are there. And very excitingly, we're starting to add um, some shorter videos. We have one on sweet potato propagation that just went up a couple days ago, um, as well as one on Asian citrus psyllid. So subscribe and you'll be able to stay updated. Also, if we didn't get to your question tonight, or if this just prompted a whole lot of other questions in your mind that are garden related, we welcome you to stay in touch with us. Our help desk are here to research and respond to your questions. Um, the library will go ahead and plop the email in the chat feature. But if you um, go ahead and email us uh, with a description of, your, um, of what your question is, if you have pictures and the city in which you live, more details, the merrier, we'll be able to research and respond to your question. So that's lots of different ways to stay in touch with us. The next slide, we wanted to keep you informed um, of our webinar lineup. So January and February, as of tonight, have now just happened. Um, these I keep these up here past one so you could see what's on our YouTube channel, plus those that we gave in 2020. But this is a list of all of our programs we have for the rest of the year. This is also on our website. Um, if you've signed up for our newsletter, um, you will be we send out e-blasts. Um, and we are going to put a survey, um, a link to a survey in there. One of the questions we'll ask um, if you want to receive our newsletter. And so if you're interested in it, that's a great place to reply yes and include your email and you'll be kept informed as well as get our quarterly newsletter, which has a lot of really great information as well. And not last but not least, we want to tell you about our survey. We so appreciate you coming tonight. Um, we're constantly looking for feedback. Um, how can we serve you better? Um, and we're going to post in the chat box a link. Um, if you, when you see that, if you can click on that, a new browser will open uh, for you to complete after the program, um, either tonight or in a future date. We really hope you take a few minutes to do that. It's just a few quick questions. That'll give us our contact information. So the University of California um, can send you a very short survey in 90 days that will ask you what you thought about this program. And um, it'll give us valuable information on how to improve. Um, so go ahead and look in the chat box for that link. We welcome you to fill out um, that survey so we could have your contact information. Um, we're very grateful for any feedback and support you could give our program. And with that final bit, we can get into the, the question and answers. So there's quite a few. Um, 
one a, what couple co I'm going to start with some of the questions Holly that I saw a couple different times. Um, some folks wanted to say ask if there is a source of where they can find information on when is the best type of year to propagate the different types of plants. What I would recommend is finding a great propagation book and they do have some wonderful books at the library or looking online for information on a specific plant that you want to propagate. Really propagation can be done throughout the year, but not for all plants. So different plants are different types of the, different plants are different times of the year. Um, so look up specific plants and specific information on each of those. And I think you'll, you'll get the best information that way. Helen, do you have anything to add on that or other thoughts? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, different plants like different times of year. Um, try it. You know, if you have a favorite plant and you really want to propagate it, try it at different types of year. And this is when keeping your records is really important. Mm -hmm. So if you're propagating Daphne's and you find out that they propagate for you, best at a certain time of year and when the plant is in a certain condition like during bloom, after bloom, before bloom, in the fall, you can keep those records and realize that you're more successful during those times. That's a great idea. Excellent. Thank you, Helen. Um, and talking about the time of the year, um, I'm not really related to time of the year, but a couple of people asked um, as it relates to the cooler time of the year, would you recommend, and what are your thoughts about using grow lights and heating pads, heat pads? I have not used grow lights and heat pads, but I think they're a great idea. Um, they work on regular uh, house plants. They work on seed propagation. And I think that they would help to keep, to provide your cuttings with the light that they need and with the warmth that they need. Um, cuttings will not do as well when they're cold and, or when they're overly warm. And um, they do need the bright indirect light and, he, and um, grow lamps can, can provide that. Uh, Helen, do you have any other thoughts or additions? I do not, for most of my cuttings, I, I don't use, I have heating mats and I use them a lot with my seeds. Um, for grow lights, you want them when you're really growing the top growth, like with your seeds, because you're trying to get the, um, the plant so they're not really leggy. With cuttings, you're working on the root growth more. You don't really want the top growth to be growing a lot before you have good root growth. Otherwise, the roots won't be able to support that top growth. So I do not use any lights with my cuttings, although I do put them in a bright window or else I have them in my greenhouse. Uh, so they do get some good light, but I don't try and intensify the light. Um, I'm just trying to think if I use my heating pads for, for any of my cuttings. You know, if you have a plant that's more tropical and really likes warm conditions, you can try putting your cutting tray on a heating pad and see if that helps your germination. I mean, your um, rooting of those cuttings. Um, usually I'm just doing them indoors in house temperatures. Um, so it's just kind of an ambient temperature or in my greenhouse. Okay. Again, Great. like Helen was saying on the previous answer, if you don't have a good, bright, indirect light spot in your home for your cutting and you want to do it in your home, try a grow light and take, keep notes and see what works for you. Um, if it looks like you're getting too much top growth, cut the amount of light down um, and just experiment. Um, there's nothing, there's no wrong way if it works for you. Good point. Um, there are a number of questions I'm gonna ask next that have to do with water. Um, and specifically, we'll start with a couple questions came in about cuttings. Um, the first question was, how often do you need to water cuttings? For and, me, and, that and, depends and, on how much sun is coming in through my windows um, and at, at any particular time. 
Um, I'm, I tend to water my cuttings more when it's warm outside and it's coming in through the windows than when it's, when it's overcast and cold. Um, so it really depends on your temperature conditions and um, the type of plant that it is. Succulents do not like to be overwatered at all. They, they rot very easily. So I just tend to mist succulents one or two times a week, normally once a week, but twice if it's been um, warm weather. Um, other cuttings don't need that much water depending upon what I'm using as my rooting medium and again, the temperatures. So it's an it depends answer. And if you just keep an eye on it and monitor the plant, I would go by that. Helen, do you have any more specifics? I will feel the medium and if it's starting to feel dry, I will give it some water. Before your plant has roots, it really can't take water in through uh, non-existent roots. So the only way it can take in water is through the leaves. So misting, when, when I was um, taking propagation at DVC, um, the misters were on like, I don't know, a couple times an hour that they'd missed them for a few minutes so that there was always a light mist um, on the leaves. You want to be careful that with your greenhouse effect, you have airflow so that things don't rot. So, um, you know, you want to keep things moist, but good airflow. So however you choose to do that, I put a piece of um, plastic like saran wrap type stuff just loosely over my cutting tray so that air can get through and that seems to work pretty well. The bottles with the top open so air gets through or cutting holes in the bags you put over. But you need a, a combination of moisture in the air for the leaves and um, the airflow so things don't rot. Great. Great, thank you, Helen. Um, someone had a question about um, water cuttings. Uh, do how often do they need to change out the water, if at all? Like completely empty it out and rechange it. Um, I don't change my water out. Um, I unless it starts looking murky mm -hmm. or um, something seems to be in it. Typically, it starts evaporating, and I just keep adding water to it until the roots are the size that. I'm looking for before transplanting. Um, Helen, do you have any thoughts on that? Yep, I agree with that. If the water looks yucky or it smells funny, then you know change it out. Otherwise, you can just add to it if the water looks clean. You always want to make sure with cuttings that you don't have any leaves below the water level or the leaves will rot in the water and, and um, cause problems. Great point, Helen. Thank you. Great. Um, the last water related question is, um, you talked a little, you talked about when you move plants from water to soil. Um, question came in, can you talk a little bit more about when you know when is the right time to move it from water to soil and make that transition? You're looking for roots that are about one inch long and you have um, more than one root. So if you recall the picture of the purple heart, it showed that there were three to five roots on it and they were not really long. So that was a really good point at which to start the transition to the soil or rooting medium and um, vermiculite or perlite. Um, so if you've got a clear glass container, you can see the roots right there. If it's not clear, then you can gently remove the cutting and look at the roots and see how well developed they are and then put it back if it needs more time. Great. Helen, do you have anything to add or different? Um, no, I think that that's good. One comment I would like to make is sometimes when you have your cuttings in the cutting tray, whether it's the water roots or in the perlite or, you know, whatever medium you have, um, sometimes it's fun to peek and see if you're growing any roots. And if you do that, you want to make sure you don't 
pull up on the stem that you lift, you put a fork or some implement underneath the cutting and you lift it up from the bottom so you're not breaking the roots off as you're peaking. And I wouldn't peak too often um, because each time you peak, you have a chance of damaging the roots. But the only way you're gonna know if you're getting roots is if you do occasionally peak. Thank you. Thank you. And so kind of related to that is, um, how large do you need to grow a root ball before transplanting it? Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about a plant that's already been planted or if you're talking about a cutting that you've been rooting in the rooting medium. I think a cutting that they've been, they've rooted in the rooting medium. Okay. Um, if you recall the pictures of the rose and the salvia, you could see that the roots had formed around the entire um, rooting medium, but not heavily. And so they were well structured, but not root bound, not coming out of the bottom of the pot. Um, you don't want it to be root bound. Um, you want to be able to um, remove, the medi remove the medium from the pot and then gently, if you can't tell from that point what the roots look like, you can gently brush away some of the rooting medium to see. But if it's rooted well enough to be able to pull it out and have it attached to the rooting medium, but it's not at the point where it's becoming root bound, then that's a good size. I hope that helped. I think so, thank you. So there- Helen, are... do you have anything to add? Um, usually what I do is once you've potted up a cutting in, into a potted size, if I wanna check it to see if it's established enough, I'll turn it upside down and put my hand on the soil, tap the pot or squeeze it, and I'll look at the root ball. Um, the roots should be established enough that the roots hold the soil together and you can see the whole square there. Mm -hmm. um, as Holly said, you don't want it to be root bound, but you wanna have the roots really established, not just barely in there. If you feel that the plant is not big enough to survive in your garden because you have dogs that might knock it over or something, and you feel like the roots are established in that pot, you can always pot it up into a bigger pot so the plant can get bigger and stronger before you put it in your garden. Great. Thank you. Okay, the next set of questions are about uh, rooting hormones. Um, several of them came in. Um, this one is interesting. We got this one a couple times, both on Facebook live stream and here in Zoom. A couple people mentioned honey or cinnamon as a, a rooting hormone about um, that they've read that you coat uh, your cutting in honey or cinnamon. Is this an effective method to help root um, the, the plant they're trying to propagate? I did a lot of research to find out the um, propagation methods that were scientifically established or from um, UC or other university sources. And I did not see anything about those two possibilities as rooting hormones. Doesn't mean they don't work, but I don't think it's been firmly established. Um, you could definitely experiment with it and C, try a cutting of a plant without that, and then try a cutting of the same plant at the same time in the same conditions with that and see if it makes a difference. Um, Helen, do you know anything about those two possibilities? Well, I have read some stuff about both of them. I haven't actually tried them, them, tried them myself. I know that honey has an antibacterial um, effect to it. And a lot of the problems with cutting sometimes are that they rot and bacteria gets in there on the cutting. And so you have problems that the cutting rots before it can root. 
Um, with cinnamon, I read a lot of stuff that it's an antifungal. And I've read that it's really good for damping off to sprinkle on the soil if you have problems with that. And I've also read that people use it for cuttings. I don't know it that they have the hormone that helps the cuttings to um, root quicker, but I have heard of using, people have used both of those. I don't have any actual experience myself, however. Thank you, okay. Helen. Thank you both. Um, so one uh, participant asked, um, it was mentioned um, that um, not to use a rooting hormone on soft stems. Is there something else that could be used to help that um, plant along? I don't think that those plants would need something else. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with is the geranium or pelargonium. Mm -hmm. And I have great success in propagating that simply by um, taking the cutting and planting it into the rooting medium or actually into straight potting soil, potting mix. And um, it'll, it'll grow really well from that. Um, I don't think that any sort of rooting hormone is needed for those soft stem plants. Helen, do you have more information on that? I think it depends on what people mean by soft stem. Um, when you take a cutting, you don't want the cutting to be so soft that it's limp and, you know, just falls over. You want it to be a cutting that if you bend it, it will break. Um, you can, the, the hormone that I use is called dip and grow and you can, it's a concentrate and you can do a low hormone, medium hormone and higher hormone, depending on what cuttings you're doing and how much hormone it uses. On something that is softer, you would use a low hormone and not use as much. If you use too strong of a hormone, it can cause problems in the rooting um, and be detrimental to it. Great, thank you. Another question about the rooting hormone came, came in is, are there different types of rooting hormones for different types of plants? And if yes, how do you choose which one is best? Um, Helen, you've had the most experience with the rooting hormone. Um, would you like to answer that? Well, um, I use the dip and grow. Um, Kathy Eccles, who taught at DBC and I took propagation classes from her, she said the powdered ones, especially the um, like Rutone and stuff, um, it didn't have as much in. What you wanna do is look at the concentration um, of the actual rooting hormone. There are some dried ones that do have more of the rooting hormone in them. Um, I like the dip and grow because you can pick the concentration you wanna use. And that is the one that Kathy Eccles taught me to use. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Okay, there's a couple questions about uh, roses and here's a fun one. Since we just had Valentine's Day, some folks are asking, can I use um, a, a flower from a bouquet, like a Valentine's Day bouquet? Or do they have to come directly from a rooted plant, it, fresh? I have heard of being able to use the, um, the stem of a flower that you've received in a bouquet for, for a cutting. I have not done that. Um, I would be wary of it because they are so highly treated in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, they might not grow because of that, but it doesn't hurt anything to try it. Helen, do you know, have more information on whether that works or not? I think it depends on the plant. Usually when you're looking for cuttings, you don't want to take a cutting that has a flower on the end because the flower takes so much energy to bloom. And so there isn't gonna be as much energy in that cutting. So you can always try it and you might be successful. Um, I think I probably have tried doing a, a chrysanthemum off of a, a flower that I had once, but, but anytime you're propagating, you wanna make sure that you, 
try and get things that are not blooming as you're cutting. Right, and that's very true. But with the rose, there's an exception that you do want it to have been hardened off with a flower on it. And I've been successful with that. Um, but yes, you're right that most cuttings, almost all other cuttings, you don't want to have had a flower on it. But I would give the rose a try. I just think that it might not work because of anything that the rose had been treated with. Mm -hmm. Great. So another rose question. Somebody was wondering which would produce, in your opinion, a more vigorous plant? Well, a rose that's taken from a cutting or a rose that's grafted? Or does it depend? Um, that's a very good question. Um, the rose that's been grafted has that strong rootstock on it. And that's why it was grafted to begin with. Um, when you take a cutting, you're getting the um, scion piece of the graft only, and you don't have that rootstock on it. So I would say that the original is probably stronger for that reason. But that doesn't mean that the cutting and the roses created from it are not successful. They just might not have um, the same strength that the rootstock on the grafted plant has. Helen, any other thoughts on that? You know, I'm not sure. I know with fruit trees that the rootstocks do things like limiting size and um, disease resistance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you clone the plant, you pretty much have the same the same rose. I think bigger is more variety dependent too. Some roses are just, some varieties are very vigorous and others not so much. So if you have an, a vigorous rose that you're taking a cutting off of, I would think that the, the cutting that you end up with probably will also be vigorous if it's a healthy cutting. But I, I can't promise that, that's just my guess. Thank you, Helen. Great. Okay. Um, we're about 10 minutes over program. I think we maybe could ask a couple more questions. I'm so appreciative that we have, gosh, almost 200 people still hanging on. <laughs> so you're keeping their interest, Holly. This is really great information. This is great. They're great questions. Excellent. Somebody asked, can you explain a little bit about what is activated charcoal? And is that the same as a charcoal in your home grill? Or is that something that's specific you buy at the nursery? Someone wanted a little bit more information on that, please. Right. Activated charcoal is different. It is used as a fungicide or to prevent um, disease. And it is, you can purchase it, I think, at nurseries or big box stores. Um, you can also find it online. And that's, it, it is used for other things with plants besides just propagating the cane uh, plants. It can um, help your soil. I found one article from UC Davis where it was used to, um, to clean soil that had been diseased with tomato plants. Was it straw? It was either tomato plants or strawberries in it. So there are other um, plant uses for activated charcoal, and it's definitely something to look into. Helen, do you know more about activated charcoal? No, I've never really used it with my cuttings. Okay, thanks. Okay. I, I do think it's something to look into for, for plants though. It sounded like it was valuable. Great. So I'm thinking this question maybe had to do with plant division. It didn't specify, but the question is if the ground is totally dry, completely bone dry, should the ground be wet first before you try removing the plant or perhaps a root or a De definitely. In fact, if it's bone dry, I would make sure it's very well hydrated before you try um, before you try doing a separation or division. 
Um, and again, I would water the plant well the day before doing that um, so that you know that it's got that it's a hydrated plant um, before you divide it. If you're doing it during the dormant season, you probably don't want to hydrate it first because um, you're doing it because it's dormant and you don't want to disturb that dormancy. Helen, any other thoughts? <laughs> Oops, I was reading some of the <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Okay, tell me again, which one was that one? Okay, we're talking oh, yes, about the, the watering. Absolutely. Water first. Uh, it'll make it easier to dig out. It will hydrate the plant and it will tolerate the transplanting better. Yes. Great. Well, thank you, Holly, for such an amazing presentation. And Helen, again, thank you for lending your knowledge and experience and fielding some question and answers, both live and directly chatting to folks. I think that's helpful. We got through a lot of questions. And I know there are some folks that have some very specific questions about specific plants. And if we didn't get to your questions, um, I apologize. But we do have our help desk um, and the library just put in recently, again, um, their email address. So you could email your questions directly to them. Take a look at some of the resources we provided on the handout and hope that gets you covered and started and on your way to propagating. So thank you very much again for everyone who's joining and we hope to see you soon again at another one of our, our programs.